Good evening. Good evening, Assalamualaikum and Namaste. Welcome to Air Quality Index of 235. <laughs> Although in this room, uh, thanks to extraordinarily uh, amazing technology provided by Punita Kala and Sikita Saxena <laughs> and Margo, we are only at about 92. So you are very safe. Wow. Um, you know? Yes. Talia. Talia, Talia. Exactly. <laughs> Well, anyway, listen, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to um, our sixth Mamad Ali Habib Distinguished Lecture on Pakistan. Um, for those of you who don't know my name, I'm Dr. Munis Farofi. I am the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. I also am a faculty person in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. Um, I also happen to be the person who's going to basically implore you to put your phones off or put your ringers down so that we are not disturbed through the course of this event. Before I go any further, I would really like to welcome a distinguished guest from Karachi. Um, she has flown all the way from there to be with us on this auspicious occasion, and I am referring to Ms. Tati Hamdani. Uh, Tati Saiba is the Chief of Staff to the President of Habib University and the Director of Global Engagement. Can I please ask you, Tati, to stand up and receive our applause. <laughs> so as the Director of the Institute, um, I'm often called upon to attend talks, events. I also often introduce speakers whenever I'm asked. And I will just say that the Habib Distinguished Lecture Series on Pakistan holds an extremely special place in my heart. And truly, here's why. Um, it was this particular series that inaugurated the Pakistan Studies Initiative here at UC Berkeley back in 2013. We have been building off this foundation for many years now. and. In many ways, because of the vision that the Habib family and the Habib Foundation offered us, we have really been able to put together an extraordinary ecosystem focused on Pakistan here at the Institute for South Asia Studies. And it's an ecosystem that has many component pieces. I don't get many opportunities to talk about it, but let me brag a little since I've got perhaps you know two minutes. It among other things, allows us to have all sorts of programming for Pakistan, you know, interesting programming that allows us to ask, you know, questions about Pakistan, its identity, its contemporary politics, but also its history. It's a program that has also spawned the Berkeley Urdu Language Program in Pakistan, which, as some of you perhaps know, is the only American-run <coughs> Urdu intensive semester-long program in Pakistan. We have alumna who have been on this program, who are now uh, faculty at Berkeley. I'm thinking specifically about Beth at the back. And a lot of energy has gone into this particular program, and it's been very important for us. We also have an Urdu teacher training program, which offers summer on and also semester-long Urdu as a certain language training to roughly two or three Urdu teachers a year from Pakistan. Then there is the annual uh, SSP Zada dissertation prize, which is given to the best doctoral <laughs> dissertation focused on Pakistan in the social sciences, humanities, law, education, and visual and fine arts. The same family, the Pizada family, also endowed a distinguished lecture series in Pakistan studies, which is a complement to this particular lecture. Um, it's always held in the spring, in as much as Habib is always held in the fall. And most recently, UC Berkeley has become the go-to place for an annual Fulbright conference that brings over 100 Pakistani Fulbrighters to campus. Much of this is building off a foundation that was laid back in 2013 of a vision that the Habibs got and supported. Um, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful as a result um, to the family and also to the foundation. The way in which the Habib Distinguished Lecture <coughs> Series has served as a catalyst for these opportunities that I mentioned, honestly, in my mind, speaks extremely highly of the Habib family, but also the Habib Foundation's willingness to think expansively, to think imaginatively, um, by supporting the mission of institutions like UC Berkeley. 
It's a mission that attempts to make and offer more complicated conversations about Pakistan, conversations that allow us to think about this very particular and, and sometimes peculiar country in ways that get beyond a certain kind of mainstream coverage that you will hear about Pakistan. And in so doing, in some ways, what we, I think, aspire to and what I hope we have been able to achieve over the years is, in some ways, matches the vision of the founder of the House of Habib in Pakistan, the man who actually graces this occasion, Muhammad Ali Habib. And now let me just say a few words about uh, Muhammad Ali Habib. By all accounts, he was um, an extraordinarily generous individual, a man who was extremely dedicated to not just a positive vision for Pakistan, but also a willing participant in the building of Pakistan in the 1940s and 50s. The Habib family following his death really became synonymous <coughs> with the building of schools, the financing of a wide array of charities across Pakistan. And also, and this is something that I'm always reminded of by Vasif Rizvi, who unfortunately is not here tonight, the president of Habib University, it bankrolled Pakistan in 1947. There was no money left in the treasury. So thank you, the Habib family, or no thanks to the Habib family. <laughs> <laughs> you, you decide which side of the ledger you're on. Um, to my mind, UC Berkeley, with its driving commitment to social justice, its excellence in public education, and its deep engagements with the world, is the perfect place to host the Muhammad Ali Habib Distinguished Lecture Series. And therefore, I am grateful to the Habib family and the foundation for agreeing to, in a sense, place this lecture series with us some seven years back. But there is a second reason why I am so deeply invested in this particular <coughs> series, and I look forward to it every year. You see, year upon year, this lecture series has brought absolutely amazing speakers to campus. They have included Folks like Asma Jahangir, the noted but now sadly deceased Pakistan-based human rights lawyer, <coughs> Aisha Siddiqua, perhaps the most astute observer of the Pakistan army, Christoph Jafrilo, the author <coughs> of the Pakistan Paradox, one of the best recent books on Pakistan, Mark Kanoya, a renowned scholar of the Indus Valley Civilization, and David Gilmartin, perhaps the world's leading historian of pre-partition Pakistan. And so, in some ways, Reza Rumi Saab fits perfectly in this distinguished roster of speakers. He is, in my opinion, one of the bravest and uh, most insightful thinkers on contemporary Pakistan. His rich and varied life has enabled him, in many ways, to be both the quintessential insider, but also outsider, a man who occupies both spaces simultaneously and who, as a result, offers us insights on Pakistan that I find um, extremely valuable and interesting. That said, let me share a few highlights uh, about Reza Saab's life. He was born in Lahore, and after attending Aitchison College, Rumi Saab headed off to the United Kingdom, where he received a B in economics from the London, uh, in economics from the London School of Economics. This was followed by stints in the Pakistan civil service in the 1990s, as well as United Nations pe uh, peacekeeping work in Kosovo in the early 2000s. Following his UN work, Reza Rumi joined the Asian Development Bank, where he was particularly involved in governance issues, including such you know, um, topics as decentralization, access to justice, and institutional building. His stint at the ADP led to further international development work for the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, UNDP, UNICEF, the World Bank, among others. But the irrepressible uh, Mr. Rumi wasn't content to just stop there. Starting in 2008, he entered the raucous world of Pakistan-based print journalism. And since then, he has served as a writer and editor at the Friday Times, an editor for the Daily Times, and a general commentator for several publications in South Asia and beyond. Complementing his journalistic work after 2010, Reza Rumi also became an increasingly visible fixture on TV as a political commentator. In 2013, he started hosting a current affairs um, talk show on Capital TV entitled CD Bath or Straight Talk. In January 2014, he joined Express News, where he hosted a current affairs show called Khabar Se Aage or Beyond the News. 
And around this time, he was also appointed director at the Jinnah Institute, a public policy think tank. Reza Rumi's commitment to social justice issues, citizen rights, and federalism have made him a go-to person for all manner of conversations about Pakistan. In particular, however, it was his outspoken opposition to extremist and <coughs> Islamist groups in Pakistan that rendered him a target for assassination. And in 2014, Lashkar Taiba almost got him. Although Reza Rumi survived an attack on his car, his driver Mustafa, a 25-year-old man and the bread earner for a family of 10, did not. But following this attack, uh, Rumi Saab went into exile, and although he has regularly visited Pakistan in recent years, he has successfully, thankfully, carved out a new life for himself in the US as a policy analyst, a journalist, an author, and an academic who has enjoyed stints and is enjoying stints at Ithaca College, Cornell University, NYU, as well as a whole bunch of think tanks, including the New America Foundation, the US Institute of Peace, and the National Endowment for Democracy. In whatever spare time he has left, and I don't know what time you have <laughs> after all this is done, uh, Rumi Saab thinks and publishes books focused on Pakistan and the Pakistani experience. And so, among other things, he's the author of um, Delhi by Heart, Impressions of a Pakistani Traveler, The Fractious Path, Pakistan's Democratic Transition, and Identity and Faith and Conflict. His most recent collection of essays is titled Being Pakistani, Society, Culture, and the Arts, which was published in June 2018 by HarperCollins. It is truly an honor to welcome Reza Rumi to Berkeley as our sixth Muhammad Ali Distinguished um, Speaker. No doubt we are all looking forward to hearing his thoughts on Naya Pakistan or not so Naya Pakistan, as you would <laughs> like to you know, know. But regardless, it's going to be an intriguing uh, conversation uh, with Reza Saab. And on that note, I would like to welcome him to the podium. Please join me in welcoming him to Berkeley. <laughs> Th thanks a lot for this uh, rather uh, humbling uh, <laughs> introduction, uh, too generous. Uh, I don't think that I, am, I fit into the long series of distinguished scholars that you mentioned. I'm just a student uh, myself of uh, Pakistan and the world. And I'm truly grateful uh, to the Institute for South Asia Studies and the Habib University uh, uh, who have sponsored this event. And uh, it is uh, indeed a privilege uh, to be named along uh, the line of, of rather remarkable people, some of whom I know uh, personally. Um, that, you know, this uh, talk, uh, I had prepared some notes and I thought I'll uh, read what I wrote, but as always, I thought it's better to just uh, maybe outline some of the main points of what I want to say today and then perhaps give more time for an interactive session uh, where some of the issues that I may leave out or do not explore in detail, uh, we can certainly pick them up in the Q&A session. Um, you know, the uh, Pakistan's uh, unique uh, history, uh, uh, you know, is uh, basically a tale of a country trying to uh, both search its identity and the kind of uh, governance uh, system that it wants to adopt. So since 1947, uh, from the very inception of uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, this question has really uh, been um, explored time and again. You know, what is it uh, to be a Pakistani? What does it mean uh, to be a Pakistani? Because the initial Niger definition was that everything that was not Indian is Pakistani. And then after a decade or so, people uh, who held power and thinkers realized, well, that's too limiting and perhaps we need to redefine. And so over the, over the decades, that contest whether Pakistan is going to be an Islamic state, whether it's going to be a secular state, whether it's going to be a hybrid of the two, or whether it's going to be a modern territorial nation state, is still very much an open question. And uh, it really depends on who you are in Pakistan. If you are 
a, 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 someone from the Islamist uh, parties or someone who thinks that Pakistan was created uh, to be an Islamic uh, state, then you would adhere to that particular vision. If you are a modernist, secular, you would say, well, Jinnah and Liaquat were modern Muslims, and uh, uh, Mohammed Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, in his first address as the Governor General, very clearly uh, articulated a vision for a tolerant and a moderate country, in which he uh, very clearly said that, uh, yes, the uh, uh, Pakistan's uh, creation entailed a lot of communal contest and communal violence, etc. But it was time to forget that and move on and, and rebuild and create a new uh, country. However, uh, these questions remain unresolved. And one of the uh, biggest, um, you know, kind of uh, problems that, uh, that many politicians and political parties uh, have faced uh, in Pakistan is how do they position themselves. So take the case of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, who was the first elected uh, uh, popular prime minister of Pakistan, an avowed secularist, self-styled democrat. But uh, when it came to, uh, you know, steering the country uh, after the 1971 war and the breakup of uh, Pakistan, uh, he also played the Islam card and the Muslim card rather expressly. So not only that he, uh, his party, led the uh, you know declaration of uh, the Ahmadiyya community as non-Muslim in 1974 through the Second Amendment, uh, but later on he also initiated a very comprehensive is uh, Islamization program, which was then subsequently picked up and for uh, you know cemented and 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 uh, expanded by General Zawlak, who uh, uh, took power in 1977. But alongside this uh, this contest of uh, of what is of what kind of a Pakistani state or what kind of a Pakistani society uh, uh, we were thinking in 1947. The other uh, unopened question uh, which still kind of um, remains unresolved is who is to rule this country? Is it going to be elected uh, uh, Democrats uh, uh, through a parliamentary democracy or is it going to be uh, a civil military combine, uh, you know, much like the uh, continuation of the colonial state in 1947, and that contest still plays out. So half of country, uh, Pakistan is 70 uh, years old, and half of that, w uh, you know, was uh, under direct military rule. The rest of uh, the country's existence was under either weak, tottering, or uh, you know, insecure civilian governments. And this, uh, with these two particular questions, I guess. Uh, they're also playing out in the contemporary uh, sense, uh, uh, especially uh, if we look at Pakistan today, uh, uh, these two contests are very clear. So the first one, uh, if, if you all followed uh, that, you know, a Christian woman who had been, uh, um, you know, sent to uh, prison and was in death row for eight years or so, uh, was recently acquitted by the Supreme Court, which was a very uh, kind of courageous act of, of the Supreme Court to do, but uh, immediately thereafter there were huge street protests, and for three days the country was brought to a standstill by a, a motley a group of uh, Islamists who who thought that uh, uh, you know a, a, a blasphemer uh, just cannot be uh, acquitted; uh, it is impossible, and because she happens to be a non-Muslim, she must have committed blasphemy, and that they the only a way that they would end their protests would be the actual execution of that Christian woman called Asya Bibi. And uh, we saw that, you know, the Islamists called out the military, the Supreme Court. So, for example, they said that the judges who had acquitted Asya Bibi were Rajibul Katl or fit for murder, and that the military uh, should actually remove its top commander and, uh, you know, uh, through a mutiny, uh, re replace the, the generals with more Islamic or more, fa more faithful generals. And uh, these, uh, these, uh, this was a direct uh, challenge to the state. And, um, you know, the, the current prime minister, Imran Khan, whom I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit, uh, you know, made a very strong statement saying that the state will not tolerate any kind of, uh, uh, you know, violation of law. And the writ of the state would be reestablished, but within 24 hours, uh, his government made a peace deal, uh, quote unquote, with the Islamists, 
in which they said, okay, well, you can go and review the petition and we shall uh, not file any cases against you and we shall not, uh, you know, prosecute you for treason or inciting violence. And, uh, you know, basically that, that particular narrative uh, remains unchallenged, unchecked and unpunished. And uh, part of that has to do with the fact that uh, uh, there are elements within the state who think that uh, Pakistan's destiny is to be an, uh, a, a, an Islamic country, a kind of an, a, a fortress of Islam, and uh, the other part uh, perhaps thinks, well, it's too dangerous to um, annoy a, a, a band of clerics uh, considering that there have been high-profile assassinations in Pakistan, uh, such as th that of Governor Salman Parsi in 2011, when one of his bodyguards from the elite police force <coughs> murdered him. And so you have, this, you have this contest going on. Now, in this particular uh, scenario, uh, the, uh, the rise of Imran Khan and, uh, um, and his brand of politics is, is, is both intriguing, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, we can understand it better uh, by looking at the gradual, uh, you know, a state project of creating an Islamic national, a, a, a whole uh, narrative on, uh, around Islamic nationalism, and the fact that Pakistani identity is the, is is that of a Muslim uh, identity, and uh, this is uh, uh, also exhibited by. Uh, the fact that Imran Khan's own uh, uh, election rhetoric and political rhetoric invokes uh, the uh, ideal of Medina state or a Medina welfare state, whatever that means, we really don't know because much of it is, uh, you know, shrouded in historical past, mythology, and some uh, anecdotal uh, evidence. And uh, but you know, it is a great uh, slogan. Uh, because it kind of so it, it brings in the welfareist idea of a modern uh, state much and he mentions this, these uh, examples from Scandinavia as well you know like Sweden or Norway and he says well there's redistributive growth over there the state takes care uh, of education health and other basic services and yet Pakistan will be that but plus it will be a Medina state so that uh, and and that draws a lot of uh, popular support uh, of, particularly from his uh, um, you know, support base, which is largely urban, middle class. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that Imran Khan uh, has been so successful in garnering public support in the uh, last few years and uh, rising uh, uh, to, to the top and becoming the prime minister has to do with the expansion of his support base, i.e. the middle class. The, uh, the, the Pakistani middle class, um, has grown uh, in numbers over the la last two decades. And currently, uh, Pakistan's population is around 210 million. And you know, very conservative estimates say that uh, the, the size of middle class is more than 50 million. And they could be, it could be even higher if other definitions of middle class are uh, included and it could actually go up to something like 70 million or, 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 or the groups which are near middle class or almost middle class. So you know, middle class definitions are problematic. You know, there there's no universal, singularly singularly accepted uh, definition. Uh, but in general, they are uh, measured through uh, the uh, the consumption patterns in the country. So for uh, the last two decades, uh, while Pakistan's economy is always in news uh, for uh, bailouts to uh, you know and uh, requesting the Chinese and the Saudis and the Americans and the international financial institutions to inject uh, a foreign exchange into Pakistan's economy. Uh, but the on-ground reality is that in Pakistan, there's a, 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 a flourishing consumerist society uh, where the number of motorcycles, air conditioners, washing machines, uh, even vehicles or automobiles has been increasing exponentially over the last two decades. And, uh, and at the same time, the remittances which are sent uh, by Pakistanis overseas have also seen a, an increase. I mean, only through official channels, uh, nearly $20 billion are transferred each year into Pakistan, and most of them are uh, used for household consumption. And these are only through banking channels, and if, uh, if all other channels, the non-banking channels, personal transfers or the Hundi or Hawala, you know, which is now under uh, a huge uh, sort of 
scrutiny due to uh, money laundering and anti uh, anti money laundering international regimes, it could be uh, three times the size of the official uh, number. So from 50 to 60 billion dollars, roughly. Uh, are sent in by millions of Pakistanis who work abroad. So that particularly has led to a, and at the same time, Pakistan's services sector has also grown. So it is now currently the biggest segment of Pakistan's economy, more than 60%. So jobs in, uh, you know, banking, insurance, telecom, uh, private media, uh, they have also grown exponentially over the last two decades, thereby creating a new uh, middle class, which is uh, both uh, globalized uh, in a way, uh, yet uh, which also exhibits um, uh, the traits of its uh, of, of other middle classes, which uh, we see in the region and beyond. So, for example, the Indian middle class has also expanded, and uh, it has voted in uh, the BJP uh, in recent years, which is uh, again a very uh, um, conservative and a uh, sort of a, a, a force which uh, invokes religion, uh, religious nationalism for popular support. And uh, so this middle class is not a monolith and it does not have a, have a particular political ideology. Uh, it, it comprises a variety of uh, ideologies in its fold, but, more, but most of it uh, is united on one particular point, which is to get rid of the old corrupt uh, uh, elites, the, the tra traditional political elites, which were from the landed uh, uh, landed uh, families, uh, the uh, big business industrialists like Nawaz Sharif, uh, the former prime minister who was elected three, three times, and others, and who uh, who are considered by this uh, new middle class as a as a major stumbling block to Pakistan's uh, future progress and future growth. And uh, Imran Khan's narrative kind of not only echoes that, but reinforces that. Imran Khan c considers all other political forces, uh, uh, most of the po political parties as corrupt. He has been on record uh, saying that he was, um, that he's going to prosecute all of the former leaders for corruption. He's going to try them, he's going to purge Pakistani politics of these corrupt elements, and this uh, resonates rather well. Uh, with this new middle class, and that, um, and this rise of new middle class, of obviously has other implications as well. Uh, its its size may not be uh, o overwhelmingly uh, large, uh, where it can direct or shape uh, uh, the entire spectrum of national politics, but it does have uh, a, a huge influence in public spaces. So, for example, uh, in the private uh, media, which is also uh, expanded uh, since 2002 uh, when the electronic media were deregulated by the Pakistani state just along uh, uh, around the time when the same happened in India and Bangladesh as well and there was an, and a huge expansion of media industry uh, a lot of uh, media pro professionals and technicians and media pro pro producers come from this class so they actually reproduce this particular narrative. Similarly, a lot of recruitment in the uh, state institutions like the judiciary, like the civil service, even in the military, is often uh, from this educated uh, uh, quote-unquote middle class. And at the same time, while, uh, while these uh, economic uh, transformations have been taking place and political economy shifts have taken place, uh, we should also remember that uh, due to states' long-term neglect of uh, uh, vital services such as health and education, the private sector has jumped in and has also created a parallel uh, public, uh, parallel education system. So, uh, Pakistan's largest province, the, the Punjab, which is almost 60% of the population, close to uh, about 58%, uh, half of the children that go to school actually attend a private school. Uh, there has been a manifold expansion of private uh, sector, higher education institutes and in, um, other uh, you know, spaces, uh, whether uh, in the Punjab province or uh, actually it's been a trend across the country. And uh, under the General Musharraf regime uh, um, from, two th from 1999 to 2008, this was actively encouraged uh, and su even subsidized to some extent uh, um, uh, to, to have more and more uh, 
expanded higher education sector. Now there are issues about the quality, etc. But those uh, those are a separate uh, topic for uh, discussion. At the moment, uh, it is an un unprecedented moment that for a young Pakistani graduating from a high school, he or she has far greater opportunities uh, to study in uh, in different fields than than it ever was. And these. Uh, um, these shifts are also reflected in the increasing um, uh, participation of women in higher education. So if you look at the public sector education universities, uh, almost or actually at some point it was more than half, but nearly half of the student body in Pakistan's public sector universities uh, comprises young women. Uh, if you look at uh, women's role in public uh, spheres, it has also uh, expanded uh, Way, I mean, far, far too much than, than at least I remember in my lifetime. So, for example, I can give you a figure that the, in the um, General Musharraf also, um, uh, you know, changed the constitution to have reserved seats for women at the national and the provincial levels. And uh, in the parliament uh, that, um, uh, uh, that was elected from 2008 to 2013, uh, there were 72 uh, women parliamentarians and they generated 80% of the business in the National mm -hmm. Assembly and tabled more than 60% of the private legislation bills. Now that also kind of explains that the kind of shifts that Pakistan has been undergoing in the, in the past two decades. And, and all of this, all of this, uh, this creation of new middle class, high consumption, more engagement of urban, uh, um, urban professionals, uh, in the in, in in the national conversations in the national politics means that there is a greater uh, uh, contest uh, for a different uh, shape and a different future for Pakistan and that is perhaps what Imran Khan's promise of Naya Pakistan uh, promises and denotes uh, uh, it caters to these aspirations of a uh, of an urban population uh, uh, who who want a a country which is uh, governed uh, in a different manner, which delivers uh, in a different manner, and which perhaps has a, a, an alternative future trajectory. Now what that is, uh, obviously these are qu questions which are open questions. But I think uh, uh, at the same time what is um, uh, happening uh, um, <coughs> alongside these uh, shifts is that, you know, not all of these transformations or uh, uh, changes in uh, dem Demography and and one one important demographic fa um, you know transition or, or transformation that I uh, forgot uh, to mention earlier is the fact that Pakistan also happens to be the youngest country in the South Asian region. So the median mm -hmm. age of a Pakistani today is somewhere between 23 and 24, with uh, almost two thirds of population below the age of 30, and uh, nearly 70 percent uh, of the population. In, uh, in, in this category of, uh, again, these definitions are very problematic. They vary from government to government and agency to agency. But generally, a, b below the age of 35 uh, is, is what is kind of uh, generally accepted as the youth or the new, uh, new citizens. And, and therefore, you have a, a, a far greater participation by young people in both the electoral process as well as in the uh, uh, public conversations about politics and about the future of Pakistan. And uh, a lot of them are again uh, uh, relate to Imran Khan's uh, politics, his, uh, his charisma and his uh, kind of a clean vision uh, for the future. But how clean is it, how different it is, how naya or new it is, is it, that's again a question that has to be uh, looked into with some greater detail and scrutiny. I think uh, the, uh, the uh, larger story, again, which is not uh, only limited to Pakistan, but is actually common to the South Asian countries, is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the post-colonial state um, uh, kind of reproduces the, a lot of uh, uh, colonial structures, whether it is uh, the way police is organized and rules. Uh, so all South Asian countries are still governed by the 1861 Police Act, which is a coercive uh, you know, policing law, uh, which treats uh, you know natives as uh, as uh, uh, subjects to be 
uh, suppressed and contained and you know uh, punished if need be uh, in both pu public spaces and prisons. Uh, it also uh, retains uh, the civil service structure, which was actually designed and uh, and uh, uh, put into place uh, somewhere in the middle of 19th century, and it really hasn't changed. And so there are these colonial uh, po post-colonial continuities, uh, and and you see that uh, a lot of uh, state citizen disconnect in Pakistan, in India, and in Bangladesh, and uh, other countries is uh, linked to this essential uh, kind of a conflict or a or a, um, pro um, a, a, a problem which uh, which uh, uh, the uh, the new new countries or young countries have still to address. They in in India there have been some moves to uh, reorganize the civil service, but again at very uh, minimal level. The other important uh, feature of this is that these are very centralized states even today. So the local governments, Hastings in Pakistan, Bangladesh and India are very weak. I mean in, in India only recently uh, the local governments, Hastings has been uh, kind of empowered but it still operates by and large under the, uh, uh, the um, centrally appointed uh, district of uh, um, bureaucracy. And in Bangladesh is a unitary state it does not have provinces at all, and its local governments again uh, exist, but they function under the centrally appointed civil service. So power, in real terms, has neither been devolved uh, nor been uh, nor has been uh, decentered. And same goes for Pakistan. And in fact, the irony in Pakistan is that every time we have a military ruler, he introduces a a, a, a local government's high term, and then you have political governments coming in; they roll roll it back and send them home and you have no local government. So there is this, there's this larger um, uh, you know, uh, disconnect as well uh, which is uh, shaping uh, this, this kind of um, protest and uh, this uh, outrage against the way the older or the old Pakistan uh, um, operates and, op and, and operated for decades. And um, Imran Khan is also a proponent of uh, local government, and a lot, and that has been his promise. So, uh, in the last five years, when his party was ruling uh, one of the provinces, i.e., the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, he did put into place a fairly decent local government, system and uh, you know started off with some uh, uh, some some cosmetic and some a little more than cosmetic police reforms, where some. Uh, a greater degree of police accountability was introduced and that perhaps uh, became a model for capturing the imagination of a lot of uh, other uh, voters uh, during the 2018 elections. And uh, so this, this particular um, uh, you know, issue with the, with the, uh, with the post-colonial state and the, and the citizen state disconnect um, leads to a, a, a kind of a a brand of politics that um, that ironically uh, calls in for a, a strong man to uh, fix uh, this dysfunctional system. So whether that strong man is Imran Khan, uh, Narendra Modi in India, or strong woman in Bangladesh who can fix and fire and hire judges, etc., or uh, you know throw all the opposition. Uh, leaders in jail. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the 2014 elections in Bangladesh uh, were boycotted by almost all the opposition parties and it's, it's for all practical purposes a one-party democracy. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to, given, uh, uh, given these examples from South Asia, because there's a, there's a common uh, uh, trend uh, that we see uh, in, in both in terms of uh, the clamor for change, something drastic to be done by a strong leader, and at the same time, a, a, um, an overemphasis on the power and the magic and charisma of a strong leader uh, to do that. And, and um, part of that is also uh, promoted in the case uh, of India by the uh, growing power of the corporations and, the, and uh, that, that, that paint both Modi as a kind of a messiah for uh, the uh, middle classes and the poor in India, promising a better economic future. Um, and and you see his photographs, his posters, his his personal pro projection as this uh, as this uh, one man who can set everything correct 
uh, in a short span of time. And, and it's uh, Imran Khan's um, uh, projection and his imagination uh, and the way he is viewed and he's, he's, he's imagined as his deliverer of good governance is no different. So, for example, Imran Khan's party has uh, uh, senior uh, turncoats from, from the other parties that he uh, sort of um, attacks and wants to undo. Uh, be because they've crossed over to into his party, so they have become kind of clean and less corrupt or, or, or new. And uh, a lot of people, when you point out to Imran Khan supporters that, you know, he's also relying on the other corrupt elites uh, that have been ruling the, the country, so the re response is that Imran Khan is clean himself, and he will ensure that nobody indulges in, in corruption. He will ensure it will fix everything. So there's this, this whole... Uh, you know, idea of uh, of a strong man, uh, you know, fixing uh, long-term structural age-old problems uh, for the general populace, and that places Pakistan in a kind of a global moment. Uh, you know, so it is not just Pakistan, India, or to some degree Bangladesh in there, but you know, we see a, a, a global rise of this uh, uh, both yearning and support for strong men. Uh, uh, who would uh, intervene and fix things. So whether it is uh, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, who also promises to be this um, great, I mean, and he has delivered, to be fair uh, to him, to, despite all his autocratic tendencies and, and soft fascism that he's instituted in Turkey, uh, you know, by jailing hundreds of journalists, academics, and, and, and activists. I mean, you know, during his, uh, his uh, reign, uh, and that's what I would call, uh, um, the per capita incomes in Turkey have trebled, and uh, the, uh, the uh, delivery uh, or access to education is close to 98 or 99 percent in the past uh, two decades or so. Uh, and if you look at you know here in the U.S., uh, we we again see that uh, the rise of Donald Trump uh, also promises uh, the same kind of you know there's a, there's one man who's actually going to build a wall. To keep all the you know thugs and murderers and rapists away from a gr uh, from a great country, and you you so you have this this guy who's going to bring back all the jobs that the uh, that the Chinese crooks have taken away. So it's 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 that a popular narrative, uh, you know. And Pakistan is no exception. You know, you Imran Khan is no exception. I mean, he fits into this larger global moment where we are seeing uh, uh, a, a a rise of a very uh, toxic brand of. Uh, nationalism and, dare I say, fascism. And uh, the recent election in Brazil of a, of a, of a person who's uh, clearly uh, very, very not Nazi-esque in his pronouncements and approach uh, is again a testament that it is, you know, it is, it is kind of a global epidemic. And, uh, and we look, if you look at what's happening in Europe, I mean, in, uh, in Germany, in Bosnia, in Italy, in Hungary, uh, you know, the, the list grows. And so, so I guess the near Pakistan, therefore, is uh, is not really uh, new. It is it is definitely a new uh, new society that is um, coming into shape due to all the political economy transformations and shifts that I outlined. It is a, it is a, a a a whole set of new aspirations in um, in the uh, in, in in the urban. Uh, uh, a sort of population, uh, pockets of urban population, but is it new brand of politics? Well, not really. Uh, it is not because Imran Khan's uh, engagement um, with the national po political scene is very much uh, linked to the kind of rhetoric that has been used in Pakistan uh, since its inception um, against the elected politicians. So. Uh, there was a governor general in uh, uh, um, Sikandar Mirza who wrote famously saying that democracy does not suit the genius of Pakistanis in 1956. Mm -hmm. And uh, General Ayub Khan uh, put into place a, a whole uh, law which was uh, called EBDO, the Electoral Bodies Disqualification Order in 1956. And the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, who was disqualified in 2017, again he was disqualified on the on the basis of alleged corruption. Although that particular corrupt practice was not even proved, uh, is yet to be proved because there are two or three trials going on parallel. 
So in a way that that uh, that anti-politics rhetoric that uh, Imran Khan uh, 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 projects and and presents uh, is very much the kind of uh, uh, approach that the uh, uh, civil military establishment in Pakistan, which has ruled uh, 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 the country for much of its life, uh, has also been pro pro projecting. Um, and also, I think uh, uh, one one other important uh, um, aspect which uh, needs to be highlighted uh, is that uh, by uh, invoking the religious um, uh, sort of passions, uh, the, re the references to an, uh, a, a glorious ancient golden past, such as the Medina state. Uh, Imran Khan is again uh, repeating what the earlier rulers since 1947 have been doing. Uh, they have uh, consistently uh, been using uh, the religion card to solidify and consolidate their power uh, as early as 1940. Nine, uh, yeah, the uh, Pakistani politicians uh, uh, passed some something which was called the Objectives Resolution, uh, that basically declared declared that Pakistan was to be governed under the uh, both um, uh, a, a hybrid of democracy and a uh, and a Sharia, and later on the Objectives Resolution was not um, justiciable or 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 could not be enforced, but General Ziaullah a couple of decades later made it into a part of the constitution and it still exists as a constitutional provision as article 2a which can be both taken to courts if, if any act of the parliament of the government is found to be against the sharia you can actually uh, get it revoked so uh, i mean and there, and there are countless examples in in every every period of pakistani history where religion has been used and abused uh, to consolidate political power. So in that sense also, I think uh, this, um, this uh, reference uh, uh, to both a Medina state and also uh, um, playing a bit soft on the, um, um, the Islamist parties and, and Islamist groups, I think uh, the newness uh, is not very much there. I think it, is, it, it really remains um, to be seen how much of uh, his promises he can deliver um, uh, because there are uh, uh, a there are structural constraints, there are structural problems as I've outlined both in the nature of state, the way state is organized, but also in Mount Khan takes power in a, a peculiarly difficult uh, situation where, uh, due to uh, excessive borrowing in the recent years, uh, Pakistani state is facing a huge balance of payments crisis, which means uh, that uh, Pakistan would have uh, to take an uh, a bailout program from the International Monetary Fund, which is going to impose uh, severe restrictions on public spending, on development expenditures, and a lot of welfareist agenda that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan is promising would definitely be difficult to finance to begin with. Whether it's realized or not, there would be a, a, a genuine shortage of um, uh, you know, re resources uh, to be invested in that, in, in that particular ag agenda. I think the other um, uh, important uh, final uh, I'd, I'd like to add uh, this development that, you know, I always, uh, for the past few years, I've been uh, viewing Pakistan's uh, current uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, how to put it, I, I, I want to avoid this, uh, these terms used by, used by Western media, imploring, exploding, failing, failed state. Uh, so Pakistan's current tension, if I may add that, or, or the... <coughs> or the contest that is uh, underway in the past decade or so uh, is, is actually um, a, a, a indicates both a political transition and a society which is under transition. So uh, there, there have been some uh, historically important changes. For example, uh, the 2018 elections, uh, third in, in a decade, uh, is a departure from past trend that I outlined at the start. For example, uh, the, the usual trend has been a decade-long military regime followed by a civilian government, fired uh, or, or a, or a, or a uh, number of weak civilian governments that don't complete their tenure, uh, fired, sent home, and another military dictator steps in. And each time, interestingly, all three uh, major military dic dictatorships were fully supported by the United States as well. So we must not 
uh, forget the role of um, uh, the international community, particularly the U.S., uh, which has uh, uh, been a very comfortable and, an, uh, and a blind ally to uh, the most um, uh, sort of regressive of military regimes, such as that of General Ziaul Haq, or even uh, before that, uh, General Ayub Khan. Uh, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, right after Ayub Khan's tenure, we had the tensions with our eastern wing which, uh, and, and a civil war, uh, later resulting in the formation of Bangladesh. And um, uh, so there is a departure from that trend. So we have what now regular election. Uh, uh, we have a kind of a, a, a change uh, underway in the way, um, in the institutional norms where both the electoral process, democracy as an idea, is, is far widely acceptable than it ever was in uh, the past um, seven decades. At the same time, what we also uh, witness is that due to this, uh, <coughs> this repeated transfer of power uh, from one civilian government to another, the traditional uh, power centers in Pakistan, such as the military and the civil bureaucracy, uh, are also uh, somewhat anxious. And their anxiety is uh, very uh, evident from the fact uh, that they, uh, if Pakistan uh, is to follow this, this democratic path and uh, take this democratic transition uh, forward, let's say, for another decade, uh, their power uh, is going to recede. I mean, already Pakistan's military has taken a back seat since the exit of General Musharraf in the first, you know, um, and uh, a, a coup d'etat no longer is a viable option for the military commanders. So that by itself uh, uh, speaks uh, of, a, of a shift. And, uh, and, and if this process continues, then obviously uh, the hold over the national affairs that the military has enjoyed traditionally and, the, and its partner, the civil, uh, civil bureaucracy, again designed under the, the colonial regimes, etc., uh, is going to wane further. So, uh, so, that, so this particular anxiety is also being reflected in what we see in the reports that we, we, we have seen in the manipulation that took place prior to the elections in uh, uh, July of 2018. Uh, the, uh, you know, there were uh, the two mainstream parties, the Pakistan People's Party and uh, the party uh, headed by Nawaz Sharif, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, complaint of pre-poll rigging and engineering. Uh, there were also reports on selected um, uh, interference on the polling day. And along, uh, along with this kind of um, manipulation uh, prior to the polls and at the, on the polling day, there has also been increased uh, uh, you know, unstated policy on, of censorship on media. So there have been you know, two big media houses of uh, Pakistan, uh, the Geo Network and the Dawn uh, newspaper have been under fire in one way or the other uh, to either change their position or you know reduce their support uh, for the former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif when he, when he was still uh, ruling and then uh, he was facing trials and uh, Dawn has faced um, you know um, reduction in its circulation. It has been. Uh, Pre prevented from being circulated to many parts of the country, and the Geo Television in 2017 was routinely taken off air by the cable op operators rather mysteriously. So, unlike the past, when the when there were direct uh, orders to censor newspapers and advisories issued to television, while well, television uh, there was only one channel, but newspapers particularly, this time even the mode of censorship is somewhat more sophisticated and somewhat, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, hidden uh, in the sense that nobody, there is no official policy of censorship, there is no advisory which has been issued by any branch of the government, yet there is censorship taking place and there is a lot of self-censorship self, self that takes place. And I can say that because I also, as an editor, I, 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 I've stopped uh, checking uh, the way articles or editorials or reports are framed by, I just like have a ch checklist, is there anything against uh, the religion, check if, if it, anything against the army, check anything against China, check anything against this power center, check 
and my editing work is done. That's all I do. <laughs> so you know, I I need to shift my change my career, and uh, and so so I guess what what uh, what all of this uh, this anxiety is um, is leading to more than uh, more than the um, project of Nia Pakistan uh, promised by Imran Khan. I think uh, uh, more uh, a a greater story is that uh, how. Pakistan is transforming into a different kind of society, uh, both a political and a civil uh, society, which which uh, breaks from its past trends, and at the same time, uh, how does it cater to the aspirations of a uh, a, a, a burgeoning population of which a sizable <coughs> number lives in urban conditions and urban areas and requires clean governance and better service delivery and reduced everyday corruption and i think these are these are the kind of issues which which momentarily have appropriated by uh, imran khan but they will remain in political conversations and discourse <coughs> in the years to come i think i'll stop here because i may have <laughs> gone over time thank you thank you